Sup guys, this is Theron, and tonight we're taking another dive into the Parawatch wiki. Tonight's thread was started by user Serotonin Says on June 1st, 2020. It's called MK Whiteout and how the CIA tried to kill Pride. Let's begin. There's a content warning listing institutional homophobia and transphobia, sex crimes, and human experimentation. MKUltra is the most infamous of the CIA's experimentation programs, but it's not the only one. Recently declassified CIA documents reference projects such as MK Smilodon, MK Waldo, and MK Isolde, all of which are woefully incomplete. MK Smilodon got dismissed by the news as the CIA's X-Files project, because any project that deals with trying to control the weather using human conduits is going to be called that by anyone not in the know. One thing that got largely overlooked by the news was something called MK Whiteout. By the late 60s, the MK projects were starting to lose funding, as the US government became more concerned about the space race and how badly the Vietnam War was going. But one place that Nixon wanted to focus was on oppressing minorities. The entire reason he refused to legalize pot was because he wanted more excuses for African Americans and hippies to be arrested. And when it came to the fledgling LGBT community, he was more than willing to turn a blind eye to the CIA testing using pride as a testing ground for an atrocity. May 1971. Stonewall had taken place less than two years before, and CIA Director Richard Helms gives the green light for MK Whiteout, a biological warfare initiative that was to use, and I quote, infectious mutagenic agents to attempt to cure homosexual psychopathy for the good of the American people. Their so-called cure? A hybrid of botulism and something known as the Carpathian Agent. June 1972, San Francisco. Several things happen over the course of the week leading up to the city's first official pride parade on the 25th. On the night of the 18th, Toad Hall, one of the city's oldest gay bars featured in the 2008 biopic Milk, is broken into. Nothing is stolen, but the owners at the time are paranoid enough to dispose of all their booze after they find a Budweiser cap on a Miller bottle. Clear evidence of tampering. Early that same day, a so-called hair fairy, an individual that might be considered transgender in the modern day, identified in a police report as Barry Dent is arrested for public indecency. What transpired in the next three hours is unclear, but Dent was never seen again. Her cellmate is found clutching a knife with blood matching Dent's type on it, Sand's throat and left arm. Said cellmate's identity was not disclosed at the time, but the individual who came to collect their body is listed as Mr. Brighton, now known to be a common CIA cryptonym for cleaner agents during the Nixon administration. Starting on the 19th, three men hand out pamphlets advertising the Pride event around Castro. The pamphlets are printed on paper that has an odd texture with sharper creases. Several people get paper cuts from touching them and fall ill with strange symptoms. The Stud, another famous gay bar, is broken into on the 19th. The attempted vandal is fired upon by the owner and wounded. A black town car picks them up a block away. San Francisco Police Department does nothing about it, naturally. The 20th brings reports of over 60 different incidents of apparent botulism poisoning from across the city. All individuals who are considered queers, hair fairies, homos, whatever derogatory term you've heard, they use it to describe them. The police figured a few dead was probably a good thing, and did nothing. Doctors who treated them managed to deliver antitoxin, and noted that several of them had, quote, abnormal hair growth patterns that were not exhibited in normal human beings. A commonality among them is that they all got drinks or knew someone who was at the Wild Side West, which is, you guessed it, a gay bar, albeit one outside of Castro. Needle marks are found on several of those admitted into hospitals across the city. At San Francisco General, a toxicology screen finds the same unknown drug in five different patients. One of the doctors there has a contact in the Swiss healthcare company Roche, who confirms that it is a drug they patented a decade earlier, not yet on the market. The drug is flunitrazepam, better known today as Rufinol. On the 21st, the majority of the patients are discharged. That night, the SFPD is flooded with calls of wild animals being seen and heard throughout the city. They investigate one around Fisherman's Wharf, and find a metal light pole bent in half, with scratch marks all the way around the top as if whatever bent it over literally spun around it first. The morning of the 22nd, a young woman known only today as Millie finds one of the pamphlet men preparing for his day. She finds him coating the pamphlets with a brush covered in an unknown substance, and gathers a mob to chase him out of the district. He reportedly jumps into a black town car bound for the north. This same man is seen again in the vicinity of the City Lights bookstore in the Red Light District. Some people have speculated the existence of a CIA bolt hole in this part of the city. 
The night of the 22nd brings more calls of animal sightings. A few fortune tellers near Presidio Heights draw Hazma sigils on their doors, charms meant to ward off evil creatures. Gunshots are heard around the Castro district in the early hours of the 23rd of June. A wrecked town car is found in an alley in the neighboring Mission District, upside down and on fire. Locals claim ignorance, despite evidence of blood and torn clothing being found on the corner of 20th and Castro Street. In the end, whatever malefactor was trying to sabotage San Fran's first pride failed. The parade went on without a hitch, but not without weird things happening. Several people in the crowd reported seeing animalistic silhouettes on the buildings above the street, only to look again and see people just waving at the parade. M.K. Whiteout was shuttered on July 4, 1972. The majority of documentation related to it was incinerated, but not all of it. Among the M.K. Whiteout team was a virologist from the Socialist Republic of Romania, and his files were the ones that were recently declassified. The rest of this comes from my great aunt, who lived through a large part of this. The Romanian's files state that the original intent of the project was to create a hyper-virulent botulism, spreadable only through fluid transmissions, ensuring minimal contact with a non-psychotic populace. This is probably the reason behind the Carpathian agent's inclusion in the hybridized bacterium, as it is stated to be only transmissible through the contact of fluids on exposed wet tissue. Testing didn't go as intended. The Carpathian agent is a mutagen, and being infected with it results in physiological changes, among them being abnormal keratin growth. Hair and nails grow at super fast rates, and from what I've read, the nails are strong enough to tear into aluminum. Other signs of it are dermal and muscular mutations, and spontaneous dental growth. So they changed tactics. Instead of literally killing the gay community, they try to smear them to death. Throughout late 1972 and early 1973, the San Francisco Examiner received several anonymous pieces of mail containing film rolls appearing to depict large, hairy creatures alongside of men and women who were known members of the LGBT community, seemingly taken without their knowledge or consent. In one of them, you can even see the cameras misaligned with the hole it's meant to stick through, and you can see the inside of the drywall. If you don't get the intent here, I'm not going to spell it out. In 1983, a camera was discovered inside drywall while renovation work was being done on an apartment building in the Mission District, still containing an intact roll of film. The apartment was found in housed one of the 60 plus people who were admitted into the emergency room on June 20th, 1972. I've seen the photos for myself. They depict the tenant, a man named Raymond Murphy, in his bed alongside his partner, Cecil McFinn. The timer on the camera took a photo every 15 seconds. Raymond appears to be in pain, and Cecil is holding him. About two minutes in, Raymond changes. Cecil never lets go of him, and seems to be patting him on the back repeatedly. After about another minute, the change is complete, and the creature that used to be Raymond looms over his partner. Cecil is clearly afraid, his back up against the headboard of the bed. The creature bears down upon him, and his face is concealed from sight for the next three pictures. When the creature pulls away from Cecil, the man is laughing, and his face is covered in what can only be described as slobber as he pulls Raymond close to him once more. Happy Pride, everyone. Stay safe out there. Whoa. Whoa. I've heard the government's done some messed up things, but... Damn. Alright, do you guys think this is real? Leave your answer in the comments below. Subscribe and hit the bell, join the Site42 Patreon, and I'll catch you next time.